This is your muscles, and this is creatine. And this is your muscles on creatine. And this is one parent that wouldn't let his son anywhere near that kind of steroid. What's up guys, Jeff Cavalier, AthleanX.com. So obviously we have a lot to cover today because there's a lot of people with a lot of confusion and a lot of questions about creatine. I have a lot of questions when it comes to creatine and this evil steroid that I don't want my Chauncey anywhere near. Okay, first of all, Jesse, it's not a steroid. And by the way, why are you dressed like that and why are you speaking like that? What are you talking about? All concerned parents talk like this, all concerned parents dress like this, and all concerned fathers smoke a pipe. I think you're probably smoking something else. But if you allow me to actually explain to you guys what it actually does to your body, well then you'll start to understand in simple terms what creatine really actually does. You see, when you work out, that's actually the equivalent, like I said, of this iPad. It has to run and it has to function. Well, in order to do this, you need energy. And to get energy, we have a molecule in our bodies called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. It has three phosphate groups attached to it. When we work, it just gives one of those phosphate groups away, but it leaves us with something called ADP, with two phosphates. But when you supplement with creatine, what you're doing is turbocharging your body's ability to regenerate that ATP to allow you to keep working. Much like when creatine enters the muscle cell, it actually bonds with a phosphate, like this external charger does with this cord. At this point, it could actually help to regenerate the iPad by simply plugging to it and keeping it going. Well, that's what happens in your body. This phosphocreatine molecule is the powerhouse. It's what allows you to continue to work hard by just simply dropping off one of those phosphates to that ADP, getting it back to ATP, and then allowing you to keep working. And it actually does a really good job specifically in those high output, heavy burst activity like strength work. So it does a good job at helping to increase your strength. But the second thing it does is it actually helps to increase muscle size. And that's because anytime a molecule enters a cell, it oftentimes brings with it H2O or water. Well, that actually causes the cell itself to swell. And as it swells, you not only get a hypertrophy benefit from the cell swelling itself, but it actually causes an immediate weight gain. And long term, you're getting a hydrated muscle cell. And we know just like a plant, if you want it to grow, you got to give it water. If you want a muscle cell to grow, you better keep it hydrated. We know that creatine monohydrate through both mechanisms can increase both muscle size and strength. So you're saying this magic powder increases muscle size and strength? Sounds like steroids to me. As I was saying, keep those steroids away from my sweet Chauncey. We know they are totally unsafe for our youths. Okay, so obviously this is a burning question of yours and likely a legit question that a lot of concerned parents have, not those cosplaying as concerned parents, Jesse. But the difference is light years in difference because the testosterone that you take as an anabolic steroid is a synthetic hormone that enters into the cell, binds to these androgen receptors, and then most importantly, enters into the nucleus to cause DNA changes, to increase the expression of new muscle genetics, giving you a chance to actually completely change what once was into something else. So basically taking that iPad and creating a MacBook. That's not what's happening when we look at the creatine. Again, it's just giving you more energy like that battery pack was. So even though they might share the same physiological outcome in terms of size and strength, they're certainly different in terms of the magnitude, the mechanism, and even the legality of them. Because the magnitude is light years difference. You're not going to get ever as big taking creatine as you are anabolic steroids. The mechanism is obviously very different. In the legality, we're talking about a substance that is a class three drug that you're going to likely go to jail for if you're in possession of it versus an over-the-counter supplement that anybody can buy at GNC. Furthermore, it's known as a GRAS or GRAS supplement, which is generally recognized as safe by the FDA, and it has mountains of evidence that show that it actually is safe long term. As a matter of fact, 21% of males in high school right now are taking creatine and 3% of females. Honestly, from a safety perspective, I don't think they're come much safer when it comes to supplements. And for Mr. Chauncey there, uh, again, nothing to worry about. Okay, so perhaps it's not a steroid, but explain this. My coworker said his son went bald from taking creatine. I don't want my sweet Chauncey to part ways with his ravishing hair. Actually, I think it has a lot less to do with your friend's son and more to do with your friend for passing on the bad genetics that might lead to hair loss. Because when it comes to creatine and hair loss, 
I just don't think the evidence is there. Again, I think this is stemming from this confusion people have between steroids or testosterone and creatine and the effects that one has on the other. Because there is one single flawed study that was done back in 2009 of a bunch of rugby players who saw their serum levels of something called DHT, which is a byproduct of testosterone, that actually is linked to hair loss, but only when it's found in the follicle itself, not just circulating in the blood. And even in that study, though their levels were elevated, they didn't see any evidence of hair loss in the players. So just because we think that elevating DHT will cause a loss of hair in that person, if you don't see it happening, it may not be related. As a matter of fact, just training hard like those rugby players did can actually raise those levels of DHT. This is one of those areas where correlation does not equal causation. As a matter of fact, it's causing more fear. So this is probably more likely that you're gonna cause hair loss by worrying about this than actually taking it in the first place. Okay, but I've heard that creatine can be quite damaging to the kidneys. And so if there was ever any myth that was maybe only second to high protein diets causing your kidneys to fail, it's gonna be the fact that creatine supplementation causes your kidneys a lot of problems. And it's just simply not the case, and there's no evidence for that. However, there is a reason for it, and I wanna explain why you might have heard that, or why you maybe even have had to have double checked your blood work because of something that sounds exactly like creatine, but is actually much different, and it's called creatinine. Right, there's a big difference, even though they look like they're spelled the same. One is the thing that we are trying to supplement with, and the other is the wasteful byproduct of creatine in its breakdown. You see, we know that both creatine and that phosphocreatine, that energy store, right, that battery pack, can break down into this byproduct called creatinine. What that does is actually travels to the kidneys through the blood where it gets filtered out and then excreted through your urine. Well, the reason why people feel like creatine causes kidney damage is because when you supplement with this, you're gonna have higher levels of creatinine in your blood, just as a natural byproduct of having more of it in your system, especially if you're going through a loading phase. That usually would be an indicator when they test it in your blood of the function of the kidneys. If you're getting backed up levels of creatinine in your blood, it's an indicator that maybe your kidneys aren't functioning enough to clear it. But that's not the case when you're actually supplementing with creatine and it's causing higher levels. It's not indicating a decrease in function of the kidney. It's just an indicator that you're taking in more supplementally and of course your body will do exactly what it always does, it will get rid of it. So nothing to fear here. Are there any other myths that I can help put your mind at ease with? What about cramping and dehydration? I've read on the Facebook that it is very common. And so this proves once again that not everything that you read online, shocker, is accurate, especially if your source of information is the Facebook. You see, when we talk about dehydration and cramping, it's actually not likely happening directly related to the creatine that you're supplementing with. If you think about the mechanism of how it works, it might be easy to think that because as we talked about, it pulls water into the muscle cells, maybe leaving a little less to support the other tissues in your body, but that doesn't mean that you have to get dehydration symptoms from that. As a matter of fact, most often, the studies that we see show protective effects from taking creatine versus not. That being said, if you want to safeguard and make sure that you're not experiencing any cramping or dehydration, just take in 12 ounces of water for every five grams of creatine that you're taking. But the fact is, dehydration and cramping is not one of your worries, and therefore yet another myth I'm happy to dispel and help you to ease your mind in the process. Okay, so it's safer than I thought. If one was interested, how would one partake in getting it into one's body? So you want to know how to get it into your body, then you need to know the options you have. And honestly, when we start, we have to know what we're shooting for. There's a rough goal of five grams per day. And again, this is going to depend upon whether you're in a loading phase or not, which we'll get to in a second. And also the size that you are and the type of creatine that you're taking, which we'll also get to. But let's say we're shooting for that down the middle, five gram dose per day. What do we need to understand? Number one, your body makes 1.5 grams per day itself and it's made in the liver, pancreas, and kidneys from three amino acids, glycine, arginine, and methionine. Now, that's not gonna cut it though. We're still missing the amount that we need to get to, so we're gonna have to look towards the foods that we eat. A meat eater is gonna have a lot easier time doing this because meats are the only place you're going to find creatine naturally inside of those foods. So you're looking at six ounces of chicken having just 0.45 grams of creatine, however. Six ounces of steak at 0.7 grams. 16 ounces of herring, the king here of creatine, is 3.8 grams. But again, that's one pound of herring, which leads us right into the big problem here. 
How economical is it to shoot for this much creatine from your own food? Not very, because that one pound of herring is gonna cost you $15 a day. And you're gonna have to eat that every day to see these benefits. So that's gonna be $450 a month. $26 a day if you opt for steak, $18 a day if you opt for chicken. It gets actually even a little bit worse for the vegans out there because as I mentioned before, your tofu, tempeh, and edamame have zero grams of creatine in it. So can it actually produce anything? Yes, because it has those three amino acids in it, but again, you're probably gonna top out at those 1.5 grams per day. If you wanna see the supplemental benefits of creatine, and there are many, you're gonna have to supplement with it. And the good news is, a simple 30-day tub of this can cost as little as 67 cents per day. So honestly, a lot more economical. This is how much it costs for ours. And again, whether or not you use mine or not is really irrelevant, but you certainly can see that there's a much better, more economical way to get this, and you're gonna have to do it through supplements. So supplementing seems to be most logical, but there's still so much I need to know about creatine, such as what form to take, how much to take, and I've even heard about loading and not loading. Please tell me everything I need to know. Okay, so that's a lot of questions, but let me see if I can do my best to answer all of them for you here very clearly. Now, we talked about there being a range on the dosage, and it really is affected by two major things. Number one, the type of creatine that you're taking, which I'll explain here in a second, and also some new research showing that it's the size of the person taking the creatine that could have an influence on how much you should take. Now, if we go back to the five gram dose, that's the pretty much readily accepted dose for creatine monohydrate that's been included in all the research. But there is some variation here that could be very specific to you. Number one, again, what type are you taking? And here it really comes down to two major types of creatine. We're talking about hydrochloride or monohydrate. And the only difference here is the fact that the creatine molecule is bound to something different. In the case of hydrochloride, it's bound to hydrochloric acid. In the case of monohydrate, it's bound to a water molecule. Now, ironically, even though it's bound to a water molecule, monohydrate doesn't dissolve as well in water because the structure gets altered to become more crystalline when you do this binding here. That doesn't happen with hydrochloric acid. However, that does have some implications. If this is not dissolving as well in water, typically you need to have higher dosages because it also isn't as absorbable in the human body once you ingest it. Whereas the hydrochloric acid bound version of creatine is actually more dissolvable, more absorbable by the body, and therefore you can get away with lower dosages. So the stated dosages are really about two to three grams when you're taking hydrochloride versus five to then 10 grams. Why do I say 10 grams? Because that second part of the equation comes in here. We're talking about body weight. Again, some people suggesting that the heavier the body weights, 200 plus pounds, are gonna start to benefit more so from higher dosage of creatine per day, seven, eight, 10 grams per day. People on the lower body weight side of this can get away with less, maybe even around three or four grams of monohydrate. However, again, you have to be quite light here. The typical dosage of five grams seems to work well for people in that 160, 170, 180 range. All right now, there is some differences here too. Number one, the taste. If you were gonna buy this as a standalone ingredient, this is extremely sour. It tastes like sucking on a lemon. And you couldn't put it in, let's say, a protein shake and not notice. It would taste like shit. That's why you have to kind of put it into something like a pre-workout, which we do, because you're gonna have those highly acidic type flavors. And this is, uh, sunny pink lemonade, so things like that. The monohydrate is gonna not really have a, a flavor, especially if, it, if it's uh, highly micronized, but you can probably put it into more things. You could put it into a protein shake and not notice it. So there's some more versatility in terms of the two. I will say that anybody, the only difference here for me is they both mechanically work the same. They're gonna give you the same end result. However, getting there might be vastly different. If you have any type of gut issues at all, it's likely due to the lesser absorbability of monohydrate, and I always tell people in that case, just shift to hydrochloride. It might be at a slightly increased cost, but you're not gonna have any of those bloating side effects that you might be getting from the monohydrate, and that only happens in about 15% of the people. Now, when we talk about loading or not loading, you mentioned it, the thing is, that really is a personal choice too. It's depending upon how fast you wanna to start to see the benefits of creatine. But at some point, they're all gonna equal out. Because a loading phase would consist of you taking five grams four to five times a day. So that's 20 to 25 grams in a day for five days, which would saturate your body's storage levels of creatine. If you don't wanna do that, 
You don't have to. You can simply take five grams per day every single day. In around three to four weeks, you're going to be the same level that you were as the people that were taking it in five days. So the only consideration here is if you're doing it for a performance increase, maybe surrounding a game or an event that you're preparing for, then maybe you'd want to take advantage of the loading phase. If not, you can simply just take it and prolong that. Of course, even if you do load, you're still going to continue to take five grams per day. The next thing is what's the best time to take creatine? Because a lot of people ask that question. Pre-workout, post-workout, at night. Well, honestly, the research shows this. 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. specifically. That means all day. In other words, you can take this at any point in the day, you're gonna have the same type of benefits as long as you continue to take it on a consistent basis to keep those storage levels high. And finally, do you continue to take it forever? Well, the answer is, do you have to cycle or not? No, you don't have to cycle. There's been a lot of research here too. It's pretty safe to continue to take this without having to get on and off. Again, very, very safe supplement, depending upon which choice you make here. It's really dependent upon how your body reacts to it. Well then, what kind of muscles can my Chauncey expect to gain from taking creatine? I do fear that he will look like the next Dorian Yates, especially because he's predisposed to superior muscle building genetics. Like this. You know, it's funny that you said that because this whole time I'm trying to think to myself, who does Chauncey's dad remind me of? And it's Dorian Yates. There's such a striking resemblance. However, on creatine, I want to make sure I clear up for you. You mentioned how much muscle can Chauncey gain. I want to clear up that it's actually the weight that he's going to gain because that weight is going to be divided into water weight and some muscle gain. Now, typically within the first seven to 10 days of starting creatine monohydrate or any form of creatine for that matter, two to three pounds of weight gain. That's really coming from that intracellular water that's actually going to be a good thing long-term because over the course of four to 12 weeks, that more hydrated muscle, a better, more optimal environment for muscle growth is going to contribute additional muscle gains to that. So then you're gonna see up to four to five pounds in that time period. So yes, he's gonna gain some weight. Hopefully, yes, he's gonna gain some muscle here, but based on his family tree, I think Dorian's Olympia titles are probably safe. Will my Chauncey get stronger? I must admit I did not aim to raise a lad that is frail and cannot hold his own in a tussle with a few rapscallions and ruffians. Well, here again, look, it, the problems kind of start at home because with a name like Chauncey, I can't really guarantee he's not in for at least a few ass kickings in his life. But when we talk about how much strength gain there is possible, they're actually quite impressive. You're talking about five to 15% over the four to 12 weeks. Now keep in mind, that's gonna be most pronounced on your bigger compound lifts. For example, if you take a squat, a 300 pound squatter at the start of taking creatine might actually wind up squatting 315 to even up to 345 pounds. Again, less pronounced if you're talking about isolation lifts like a concentration curl, but the, the gains are definitely real. And again, that's regardless of what type of creatine that you take. I must admit, I'm coming full circle on this creatine supplement that you speak of. Now, if I, wise beyond my years as an older gentleman, want to start taking creatine, is that a good idea? Not only do I think that's a good idea, I actually think it might be a great idea because this represents some of the most exciting new research when it comes to creatine supplementation and it's in the older population. We're talking about its improvements in overall brain health. So decreased brain fog, increasing your memory, actually increasing overall brain function. So even when you have a state of sleep deprivation or if you're stressed out, your brain's still operating at a higher functional level actually decreasing the incidence of progressive neurological diseases like MS or ALS or Parkinson's. Having the ability to, as we said before, preserve muscle mass so that you're not only keeping more of your muscle as you age, but you're decreasing the risks that are associated with muscle loss. So overall, increasing your functional longevity. The idea is this might be one of the best things you could possibly take if you're older, not just, oh, maybe I should. I think it's looking like it might be a necessity for everybody, athlete or not. That's it. I'm gonna buy creatine myself and for Chauncey, but where should I buy it? Well, of course the options are unlimited. You can always go to Amazon, GNC, CVS, Vitamin Shop. Of course you can go to athlinerx.com, which I would prefer simply just being honored that you chose mine over others. The fact is, if you're looking for that HCL variation, we actually have it included in our pre-workout Excite. And of course, available in two sizes, creatine monohydrate. 30 days and 90 days. By the way, you're looking for information on the only supplement more popular than creatine when it comes to muscle building, you're gonna to wanna to check out my video on protein powder that you can watch here. If you haven't done so, make sure you click subscribe, turn on your notifications so you never miss a video when we're putting out full programs, meal plans, supplements, guys, available over at athlinex.com. See ya.